Um, Andres has laid out the commission report. Jayla has commented on how it fits with the IMF's approach uh, and reinforced a number of the proposals. So the floor is basically open for questions, comments, suggestions on both the substance and uh, how to get it done. Let me ask each of you to go to the mic or get a hand mic, identify yourself, and fire away. Go ahead in the back and then up here. Three, four, five, uh, two, two, two. Uh, yes, Michael Pomerlano. I uh, I have to say that uh, I, I, I'm, it has nothing to do with the report or Chela. I, I was at the Bank of Israel and I had some exchanges with Chela at the time. I'm now back at the World Bank. And I basically at the time told her that this program is destined to fall. But I have a far more substantive problem and I'm frankly using this setting to raise it and say that all this assistance of $16.5 billion is basically a confluence of self-interest on the part of the international community, the fund that is hyperactive and wants to jump and extend funds to demonstrate uh, participation, the country uh, nomenclatura or oligarchy that wants to get their money, their hands on 16 billion, and uh, self-appointed you know, uh, saviors that want to do reforms. And I have been working in this area for 20 years, and I can tell you that you can want reform for a country no more than the country wants for itself. And what you saw recently with the demonstration of a former criminal becoming president and the destiny of a country that is not going to undertake any reform sort of uh, affirms my prophecy to Chela when I was at the Bank of Israel and told her it's bound to fail. Now, what have you really accomplished by giving the... The, 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 the Ukraine, and I had the same exchange with Anders at the time, and you remember that, and you got upset with me saying, how dare I say that? <laughs> but what did you accomplish? You postponed the inevitable, you indebted this country, the public purse, by another 11 billion, uh, GDP of maybe 11, so we're looking at about, no, 200, so maybe 5, 6 percent, and you shifted responsibility for the private sector because we had a subsidiary that was involved in, in, in Ukraine and we took the license away and we pulled them out of the Ukraine at the time because it was, so that demonstrates Bank of Israel acted with a clear sentiment it's not going to work. So anyway, the, the real debt which uh, Anders points out is not on the public debt the whatever 30%, it's the private sector where, where there is repayments of about 50, 60 billion. So all you are doing, you are assisting by giving this money, the private sector, and you're bailing them out as opposed to bailing them in. Now, why am I using this setting for a broader purpose? And the reason I use this setting is because some people hopefully will listen. The same thing is going in Greece, and the same denial is going on that there is an assistance Finally, the private sector has to be bailed in and take the hit on the chin. And the best thing for the Ukraine that can happen is a standstill and a restructuring. And if they want to do the reforms, let them do the reforms. If they don't want to do the reforms, let them not do the reforms. Thank you very much. Okay, that's a rather frontal challenge. Uh, <laughs> Andres, why don't you respond and then we'll ask Jayla if she would like to say something as well. Yeah, to begin with, if you say that it would fail and it has failed, I don't think that uh, the program has failed. I think it's quite important that you keep a uh, uh, country uh, floating. Uh, Ukraine has now uh, just carried out orderly uh, democratic elections. There is a possibility for a substantial change. I think that these are quite important uh, uh, achievements. We are seeing that uh, the fundamental economic uh, uh, numbers are coming uh, uh, into a reasonable ballpark. The big issue, as I emphasize, is essentially now to get, uh, on the macro side, is to get the budget deficit under control. And I don't think that this would be easier to accomplish. I don't think that it would be more social uh, friendly if uh, there was no international engagement. And of course, you can always tell people that you can, uh, 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 what is the wording, uh, stew in your own sources. But uh, I don't think that's a very helpful uh, comment. And I don't think uh, that uh, th this is uh, a standard that takes us very far. With regard to the private sector, 
thanks to the substantial foreign uh, direct investment in Ukraine, more than 80% of uh, uh, refinancing claims have been uh, refi uh, financing claims have been refinanced during the last year, and uh, this shows that, uh, that uh, for example, the foreign banks have recapitalized their banks. None of the 17 uh, uh, foreign banks uh, that have subsidiaries in Ukraine has withdrawn. On the contrary, they have uh, provided more than two billion dollars of new capital uh, for their. Uh, banks. So what I'm seeing is a constructive uh, process. Uh, Ukraine essentially had one big mistake in the uh, macroeconomic policy, the fixed exchange rate. And uh, they suffered then in the same way as uh, uh, the three Baltic uh, uh, countries. And uh, they are now uh, uh, coming back uh, more slowly since they have not uh, devalued. And I think that the IMF has guided uh, Ukraine in the right uh, direction. And now it's the question whether the, the structural reforms that have long been needed will actually be undertaken. In terms of uh, uh, income inequality and so forth, uh, uh, clearly the, the oligarchs have uh, suffered the most uh, and uh, the modern middle class in this crisis. Uh, while uh, Ukraine has a very strong uh, social safety net in the form of uh, uh, private plots, subsistence uh, agriculture uh, for, for millions uh, of people. So without n knowing the numbers, uh, I'm sure that the income uh, differences have fallen sharply during this crisis, which is also part of uh, the IMF program. So I can't really first see the alternative uh, to what the IMF uh, uh, sh should have done. And secondly, I uh, can't see that this is a negative outcome uh, given uh, the start of it. On the contrary, I think that it's uh, quite remarkable that uh, uh, Ukraine has uh, managed to come out so orderly. And sometimes you do lose 15% uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, GDP. Finland lost 14% uh, of GDP in uh, 92-93, and that got the country going. Uh, Again, I think that this is a shock that should put uh, Ukraine onto the r r right track. Jill, you want to add anything? I think um, under summarized it well. I, I think uh, it's important to uh, do a post mortem and to look at what was done and what went well and what didn't go well. In terms of private sector uh, bailout, that's uh, a very wrong interpretation of the program. A lot of the private sector, as Ander said, was able to restructure their loans. Um, they were able to roll over or restructure in terms which made sense to them. The banking system as well, they either uh, agreed to bring in more capital or intervened otherwise. What um, the two things and what was uh, critical in the program in 2009 was that part of this um, funds did go to the public, uh, to the government to help with some external payments and that allowed them room to make their priority payments. You have to understand that 80% of Ukraine's <coughs> budget is pensions and wages. So if they couldn't, either they had to default on their external obligations as a government, which would be a disaster, or they had to not pay wages or pensions. So IMF support was balance of payment support to help the government to make their external payments, as well as to help the central bank to build up their reserves and to provide them support that they could do the necessary refinance credit to banks which lost almost um, half of their deposit base, which was critical in restoring confidence. But again, I think, um, con you know, constructive criticism is well taken. One should always look at what could have been done better. Um, uh, as said before, we've worked on many countries. Michael, you've worked on many crisis countries. It's very important to stop the bleeding and to restore some confidence in the financial sector. And that was the key key point of the program and to do bail in exactly the opposite of what you were saying, which is to get the private sector to come in. And even um, some of the semi-government entities like, like Naftogaz restructured their debt. That's not bailing in. There, are, there were some other state-owned enterprises which restructured their debt. So I think one 
um, issue. This is personal view. One thing that surprised me very much since the start of the program was how able the private sector has been in restructuring its debt, because that was a key concern that I had, that we would see major defaults in the private sector, and you didn't see it. They were able to sit down with the creditors, with their external creditors, and rework their debt, some of which may be short term, some of which may be their own monies that were parked outside, we don't know. But all we know is that there was definitely um, private sector adjustment. Thank you. Uh, one, <clears throat> one aspect of the question I'd like to draw out with both of you, but particularly Andres and the Commission. Uh, you made a big point of using external anchors to promote internal reform. And uh, the question obviously focused on political will and ability to carry out reforms. So let me ask you to elaborate a bit on the possibility of the external anchors and uh, maybe compare three different alternatives. Uh, Ukraine recently joined the WTO. Has it been able to, or has it sought to, use WTO membership to promote internal reform the way China did so dramatically, for example, a decade ago? Second, the current IMF program. Uh, has the political machinery in Ukraine <laughs> fluctuating as it has of late, um, tried and or been able to use the IMF program to promote some of the more lasting changes. Jayla uh, uh, suggested a few. Elaborate on that. And then third, you put a lot of weight on association with the European Union, including a free trade agreement. <coughs> Would, does that seem to you to have lots more potential for strengthening both the will and ability of the political leadership of Ukraine to carry out the necessary reforms than the earlier arrangements with the global institutions, WTO and now IMF. Thank you. Uh, good and tough uh, question. WTO, no impact whatsoever. The IMF has uh, had a lot of impact. And the advantage with the IMF is uh, uh, threefold. Uh, the IMF uh, goes in, in, in a very steady way and changes concrete decisions. It deals with decisions that are not necessarily very detailed, like exchange rate, uh, uh, budget, uh, balance, uh, monetary policy. So therefore, it's very concrete, and these are important variables. And the third reason why the IMF is, uh, has a big impact is that it has a lot of money. Money uh, talks. The WTO doesn't have any money, so why should you listen to the WTO? And it doesn't have any staff so that uh, goes out and talks to people. So it's uh, a much more distant instrument. And the fundamental problem with Ukraine is that the state is weak. So it's not the people who have a problem. It's not the private sector. But what do you do with a malfunctioning state? Uh, we often see that young people try, idealistically, to join the state and realize that it's impossible to change something from within. And therefore, it's typically our Ukrainian commissioners, most of all Professor Alexander Paschaver, who pushed this idea of external anchors. It's not the foreign commissioners. It's the, the Ukrainians who say, we can only get this done against our state if we have uh, uh, outside uh, uh, support. And then they were discussing whether we should call it lighthouses, mayak in Russian, or if we should call it uh, anchors, yakr. The uh, Ukrainians were read that uh, yakr, uh, anchor would sound as if it's something is falling down, while a mayak would be a lighthouse that is leading instead. But uh, we stuck to, uh, stuck to anchor in the end. And the European Union, uh, it's less the free trade agreement in itself than uh, the l vast amount of acquis communautaire that you have to adopt. So it's a matter of modernizing the legislation of Ukraine and the modernizing standards and rules and regulations. And it's also a matter of getting uh, 
uh, bureaucrats from uh, uh, the European Union into Ukraine. Because what the European Union countries are really good at is bureaucracy, in a positive sense. <laughs> they know how bureaucracy should work. But the European Commission is not the right group for it. So uh, uh, the European Commission assistance, the TESIS program, has been pretty useless uh, in virtually every country. But when you go into the twinning, when there are st the state changes for one EU countries going to a uh, normal association uh, uh, country and uh, trying to improve the work of that state agency. That has proven very effective. So what I'm in favor of is uh, to, to do reform uh, with all kinds of support with, uh, while the, uh, the own state is poorly functioning and it's very difficult to reform the state without, uh, uh, without assistance. So this is the dilemma. But much of this really comes from our Ukrainian uh, friends. Okay, there was a, a, another, yeah, the gentleman and then the lady next to him. You go first. Yes. Uh, thank you, Anders. Actually, you gave me an opening for my comment. I really think when we talk identify, about, identify. oh, Nadia McConnell, U.S. Ukraine Foundation. When we talk about a country's political will, and if you're talking about Ukraine, you have to look at several different things. You can't just look at the political elite. You have to look at what's going on in civil society. And survey after survey over the last several years, Ukrainians have identified corruption, job creation, inflation as the priorities that they want addressed. They also identify that they do not feel that they have the system to hold their leaders accountable, except for election time. So I agree with the idea of using external anchors, and I've used that term myself, but only if we really figure out how to use the internal huge anchor that exists in Ukraine. I mean, this election proved it again and again. And if we don't figure out the strategy of how to help change the system so that they can hold government accountable, not just at election time, but throughout. Thank you. Let me just comment here, and uh, this is of course uh, perfectly true and very important. And uh, one element we put there was the law on public information. I should also say that we try to stay out of the political sphere, but if the state is the main problem, you can't quite avoid it. So we uh, go slightly light uh, in, in, in this area because uh, we don't want to get into uh, political controversy. So a big issue is how should you change the constitution? And that's uh, something that we just comment upon in uh, half a page because we thought that we couldn't avoid mentioning it, but we don't want to take uh, a stand. Our sense is that it's important to do something. And uh, uh, at the same time, we don't want to uh, state exactly what should be done since there's no consensus on this issue. Yep. Uh, Robert Krauss with Commonwealth Energy Partners. Uh, Anders, you were at Kiev Amoyla about five years ago presenting the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission. Uh, then about a year later, a high-level UNDP official visited Kiev and was told by Yakonora, please stop telling us what to do. Please help us do it. And in fact, Irina Akimova was with the UNDP at that time. Now you have a proposal for a reform commission. How do you specifically see the anchors helping the Reform Commission do it rather than just telling them what to do, first question. And second question, would Irina Akimova be better as the new Minister of Economy or would she be better in your new Reform Commission? Uh, well, uh, Irina Akimova was an anchor in our Blue Ribbon Commission five years ago, so obviously I have a positive view of her, but uh, I, I prefer not to pass uh, political judgments. Uh, that's not uh, the task I'm supposed to, to do. I think very highly of her. Full stop on that point. So <clears throat> Why we say a reform commission uh, and how it should function? Uh, in order to get anything done in Ukraine, you need to operate within the cabinet of ministers. And you need to have somebody at the level of deputy prime minister, at least, in order to uh, get anything uh, done. 
and then that uh, person needs to have staff. My ideal would be to see 20 young uh, economists uh, with good education, uh, not knowing too much about the Ukrainian situation, but being Ukrainians, uh, coming in and starting working there and learning on the spot. You need to have a critical mass of the people who have a different uh, view and uh, represent the civil society that um, Nadia was mentioning. You have lots of such people, but they have to come in a group and they need to be outsiders so that they are not uh, wedded to the old uh, bureaucratic way of uh, uh, doing things. And then you have a number of outstanding politicians who could, uh, uh, can get uh, things done. There are few, uh, but they are uh, there, and uh, one of them uh, uh, should, should take the lead because uh, as a leader for such an undertaking, you need to have uh, a good politician. A good Ukrainian position. Okay, we have two right here in the middle table, so choose between yourselves. <laughs> a friend, Burwell, from the Atlantic Council, and I just actually wanted to follow up on the Reform Commission idea. I mean, I think every think tank in this town has published a report on Ukraine at one time that says revise the institutions. And we can read our reports a year later, or two years, or three years, and it's still a mess. So can you convince me that the Reform Commission would not, in fact, be captured by those who would want to stymie reform? And I know what you just said about people being outsiders, but would it actually have power in terms of forcing the other, minist other ministries to reform? <coughs> How can we ensure that it's close enough to the system, but yet is not captured by the system? And if it doesn't work or is not set up, what does that do to the rest of your recommendations? Are, is the Reform Commission something that has to happen first before the rest of the recommendations have a, have a prayer of, of actually happening? Thanks. I, I can't resist noting on the day when President Obama just appointed his budget commission that the problems you identify are not limited to Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> And here's, I'll just follow up on Fran's question and on uh, Nadia's question. Um, you and I were in uh, different uh, fora um, writing recommendations. Um, I sort of gave up. Um, what you presented is very coherent. It's, it's good from the professional point of view. But uh, realizing the sensitivity of politics, I would like to ask a political question, especially because it's not my report, so um, I'm not endangering myself. Looking at the situation today, not knowing whether you, you, we're going to have uh, parliamentary elections or not, what are the chances of uh, the Yanukovych presidency with whoever as a prime minister getting to a consensus to a open up the system to the extent that is needed, that, that your, your uh, board is recommending, but also be, when I'm looking at your excellent recommendations, I also have a parallel list of vested interests on whose toes you are going to step on um, uh, if and when these uh, recommendations are implemented. So who is going to take on these vested interests and what is the political context, if you can drill in there. Thank you. Uh, let me start with various uh, uh, questions because it's actually quite easy because we have here uh, something from before. Uh, Yanukovych was Prime Minister from uh, November 2002 uh, until uh, January uh, 2005. And uh, what uh, happened then was that this was an alliance of essentially nine different factions. Each of them got a number of the ministries. Each did their thing very energetically. Uh, some substantial reforms were undertaken. For example, flat income tax was introduced in that period. Some substantial legislation was adopted. And uh, uh, for example, big steps towards the WTO was undertaken. So what we saw was each minister did his own job. And I think that is likely to happen regardless of who gets what post in a Yanukovych government. 
because we simply this way that uh, that political alliance uh, uh, function. So they don't coordinate, as Jayla suggested. Everybody does uh, his or her own thing. But they do so very energetically. That's what I would expect. So in that case, I would expect that some of them will do very substantial positive changes, as we actually saw those years uh, uh, in Ukraine, while others will um, uh, uh, not do, do very much. And of course, you're, you're right. Uh, uh, we know who would represent what interest, and I'm not going to name them, but, uh, because that's not the interest of this exercise. But uh, I think that a lot would happen. But uh, coordinated action would be less likely unless we get a reform commission that is, uh, is uh, strong. And uh, Fran's question, would it be captured or not? Well, uh, that we don't know. Sometimes reforms happen. Uh, as I said, we have two out of three uh, important preconditions for a reform now. What really uh, is lacking is, um, is uh, uh, that we know that there is a government and a, a parliamentary majority. Uh, and I'm much more afraid of that not happening than who would be appointed to, uh, to this post. Because you need to thrive on a momentum. If nothing happens in this year, then I think that uh, it will be uh, be blown, the, the opportunity. And uh, uh, coming back to uh, uh, Robert Krause's question, uh, who would assist the Reform Commission? All international authorities love helping a Reform Commission. So there will be no problem whatsoever to get, get assistance. The Ukraine really has a, a, a large number of uh, draft laws, for example, mainly drawn up by uh, USAID. There are hundreds of them lying in, in, in Parliament, and this is good to have. Because this is a capital, but uh, whenever you need a law, there, it's just, there are three to, to five of that kind uh, normally to take down from a shelf, and you can uh, quickly get, some, uh, get something done. But it is also good to, to adopt laws sometimes, and that's uh, something that happens uh, too seldom. Mr. Ambassador, and then back to the center table. Thank you, Jonas Hofstra, Ambassador of Sweden. You said, Anders, that the European location of, of the Ukraine is good. But what about the European orientation during the new leadership? Uh, as soon as we know who will be the president and the prime minister, I think the European Union will, will, will go say, we'd like to support you, we would like to cooperate. But more importantly, we have to show in concrete step what the Ukraine can gain out of coming closer to the European Union. We have been talking about the association treaty, we have the Eastern Partnership, and we have the Transatlantic Energy Council. So my question to you, what will be the new orientation? Will they become closer to Europe, or will they go the other way? Uh, yeah, well, as I've argued in this uh, book, how Ukraine became a market economy and democracy, I, I don't see that there is any alternative for uh, Ukraine, uh, really, because there's not much on, on offer in any other direction. The big show today is the European Association Agreement, and uh, which is, of course, part of Eastern uh, Partnership, and there are a plethora of, uh, of activities. And it's also quite striking that both uh, Yanukovych and Timoshenko have been uh, pushing quite clearly for a European orientation. Yanukovych has also added that uh, he would like Ukraine to join the customs union, but that's, uh, the customs union doesn't exist, and uh, it's not uh, likely to come into effect, so this uh, is not really a, uh, an option. So I think that this uh, should be understood uh, more verbally. And if you look upon the underlying commercial interests, the big Ukrainian steel oligarchs, they have bought steel works in Europe. And uh, the biggest of them all, Renata Khmetov, owns one steel work in uh, Bulgaria, two in northern Italy, and one just in case in Newcastle. So uh, his big interest is integration with Europe. So they look upon uh, Europe as the market where they have to be. Uh, what I think Ukrainians are much, most upset about, about Europe is the visa regulations. And uh, things need to be done in that area because that can lead to a serious alienation uh, between uh, uh, 
Ukrainians and, and Europe. Because Ukrainians say, if it's so difficult for us to travel to Europe, it's obvious that Europe doesn't want us. That's the big danger. Just to add a corollary question to that, um, is Russia totally irrelevant in this picture? Uh, you say nothing's really on offer from the other side. Uh, that's very attractive. That's apparent. But could Russia somehow foul this up? Uh, and are there sufficient pressures within Ukraine in that direction that uh, uh, even a well-designed and well-intentioned reform system might run aground on some of those concerns? Uh, well, yes. Uh, what we are seeing is that Russian businessmen are investing in Ukraine now. Russian businessmen are risk lovers. Most investors are not. Russian businessmen understand risk and how to utilize it. So uh, 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 now two out of the uh, ten biggest banks in Ukraine are Russian, and two other ba uh, banks are quite substantial. So the Russian banks have made a big advance because they realize that banks are cheap in Ukraine, and that's when one should invest, not when they're expensive. And uh, two of the biggest Ukrainian oligarchs, uh, Misha Friedman and Viktor uh, Vexelberg, are both uh, Jews from uh, Lvov Oblast, Lviv Oblast in uh, Western Ukraine. So they uh, feel perfectly at home. And uh, they like the business climate in the Ukraine. They, they recognize it. It's, it's just like home, as they say. <laughs> okay, question in the middle. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Jackson. Uh, I just had a quick comment and then a, another political question. Uh, I disagreed with the earlier comment about the role of the IMF uh, in Ukraine. It seems to me, looking back at last year, if the, the IMF hadn't come in, we would have seen job losses on a 1930s scale. We certainly would have seen a complete cutoff of uh, the gas supplies uh, coming across Ukraine uh, and could well have triggered a wider uh, recession or depression in Europe. So it seems to me the question on the IMF is what kind of prizes we should give them for the historic job they did in serving Europe. Not, not actually the after action report is an extraordinary performance by an international financial institution. Secondly, there's a degree of pessimism here about the unreformability of Ukraine, which if you look at the 65 years we've been working on anti-corruption in Greece or the 20 years in Bulgaria, I would suggest it's always frustrating in the early years. That doesn't mean it's impossible. This is fairly the norm uh, for the post-occupation, post-Soviet, post-conflict uh, areas. So I, I commend what Anders and others have done in thinking about how it happens. My, my question is, though, political. I mean, we only had a presidential election. It is not the formation of a government. It is not the form of the Constitution. This is still a very weak system, and it's not um, complete. Which of these near-term reforms are truly uh, achievable in the next uh, the circumstances we have in front of us? Can you really cut uh, pensions this year? Can you really raise prices? I can assure you President Obama wouldn't do either. Uh, in a recession, in, a, in an election year. So which of, the, of these important ones can get done in, say, the first hundred days of this presidency? Uh, thank you, Bruce. Uh, well, first, uh, to add on your first point about uh, uh, unemployment, unemployment in Ukraine today is about 10 percent, uh, which is the same level as in the U.S. So this is actually quite a remarkable uh, uh, achievement uh, given this uh, situation. Same uh, in the EU. Yeah. Ten percent. And the reason is that uh, Ukrainians are prepared to take uh, uh, wage cuts. They prefer to stay employed, uh, and uh, uh, they have taken wage cuts even in in the Khrivnyas, in spite of a big uh, devaluation. And uh, of course, I totally agree with you on. Uh, uh, on the pessimism. To me, it's, uh, it's very good in Ukraine. Everybody more or less agrees what should be done. And the only discussion is when it will actually be done. Of course it will be done eventually. But we can't say exactly uh, when. And uh, 
uh, with the choice of uh, priorities that we have chosen. We have only chosen things that can be done uh, pretty much immediately, which is the reason why uh, we did not suggest uh, territorial administrative uh, reform, reform of the, uh, the, the government. When you suggest the reform of the government as a whole, then all other activity stops for a year, because then the government spends all its time reorganizing itself. And uh, uh, therefore, we do, do not make that uh, kind, uh, kind of uh, uh, proposal. And several of these proposals are essentially uh, laws that are lying, uh, draft laws that are lying and could easily uh, be adopted. Uh, what would happen if there is no government? That's a very interesting question. And uh, Jayla, correct me if I'm wrong on this, that Ukraine has now no budget for this year. This means that the 2009 budget law in nominate terms is in effect. And given the high inflation that has taken place, this means a cut in real public expenditure by 15 to 20 percent this year. So if nothing happens, the budget deficit in political terms, the budget deficit will quickly disappear. Thanks uh, to this uh, 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 budget uh, uh, code uh, that is in existence. Am I correct, uh, Jalen? Okay, other questions? Uh, maybe, uh, yes, one right here. Uh, Andrew Behoon, The Washington Group. Uh, Anders, let me go back a little bit to, uh, to what Ariel had mentioned in, in total, and let me just pinpoint two elements of it that deal, frankly, with the uh, area of corruption right? and the attack and poss possible resolution, at least the start of a resolution on the corruption issue over there. Uh, I think you had two items there that, that pinpoint almost exactly. They're, they're like bullet shots out of the ten there. One would be uh, certainly the uh, deregulation procedures that would have to take place. And secondly would be the uh, transparency of public information uh, down below. Just a, a quick, again, a political question, really. Uh, what is the likelihood, if any, of those two elements, which are very near and dear to the civil society that Nadia was talking about, very near and dear to them, uh, what is the likelihood that the new, either presidential administration, whatever may be the, uh, the uh, cabinet of ministers and certainly the behavior of the parliament uh, right now, what is the likelihood that these can be targeted within the coming year or so, if for no other reason than at least to give a feel-good scenario for the civil society that in, in, in time will be the driving force of this country? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I think that the deregulation is quite possible uh, uh, and uh, very likely uh, because this virtually all politicians are talking about the need for deregulation. And uh, it's also like this that the, the big political interests that uh, make the important decisions and the big businessmen, they don't care about this, uh, uh, all this red tape. So it's the small uh, bureaucrats who would lose their income rather than uh, uh, the, the big role. So I think that this is perfectly possible. And we saw in '98 when Ukraine introduced this simplified uh, tax system that uh, benefited millions of small entrepreneurs. That happened at a time when virtually no reforms took place in, in Ukraine. So therefore, the deregulation of small enterprises, that you can do. Uh, when uh, uh, little else is, is happening and there's such a broad consensus now and also uh, in particular the example of Georgia having done such tremendous uh, uh, progress in this regard and Georgia is a country that uh, Ukrainians look upon as, uh, as something that is interesting uh, for them so that I think is likely. Transparency less so but uh, what is always a good incentive for governments is that if they can expose uh, their predecessor, 
and for that you need transparency. And in effect, Ukraine today has an extraordinary transparency that so many documents are being leaked and are being put out on the net. So uh, lots of uh, information that could not be released in a Western country because of libel laws uh, is being re released in, in Ukraine on a regular basis. So you, you can have all the information uh, that you want today, which means that perhaps it's better to have a proper law on public information so that you can check that this information is actually correct. So it might not be that, uh, uh, that far off. And among the anti-corruption reform, of course, the big anti-corruption reform is a gas reform. And here, I think it depends very much on what commercial interests that, uh, that would be relevant. Let me ask one final international question, Anders. Um, one of Ukraine's neighbors came through the crisis extremely well, has an exemplary record in terms of reform, and you have extolled its virtues in many other contexts, namely Poland. Uh, is there a role for Poland? Can Ukraine derive any helpful uh, precedents and or relationships from its Polish neighbor uh, building on some of its successes, both relative and absolute, in trying to pursue its own program of the type that you've laid out? Yeah, absolutely. The Poles are very anxious to play a role in the region. Uh, of course, the uh, Eastern Partnership was co-authored by uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, Radek Sikorsky and uh, Swedish Minister for Foreign Affairs Karl Bildt. And uh, uh, Poland wants to play a role. Uh, President uh, Alexander Kwasniewski was uh, uh, one of the leading mediators in the, uh, the, the Orange uh, Revolution. Uh, Poland wants to have an active foreign policy. Of course, we have two Poles on our uh, commission, uh, one former minister and one former first deputy uh, minister. Uh, so you always have Poles around in, in Ukraine. And now also you have, in particular in Western uh, Ukraine, lots of often small you know, Polish businessmen who have decided to export their business uh, uh, to uh, Ukraine. And however you turn, the Poles are there and want to play a role and they want to be helpful. Well, I wore my orange tie today in an effort to uh, restore the spirit of the Orange Revolution. I want to thank Anders, say it was a great privilege for me to participate in a very modest way in the commission, but both with uh, great admiration, Anders, for what you and your colleagues did, and uh, with great hope that the results will be on the positive side of the spectrum we thought about and talked about today. Uh, we did want to bring this set of issues to the community here in Washington. We hope that will help in promoting the positive reforms in Ukraine. Thanks again to Jayla and her colleagues who have done so much to help in that direction at the fund. Andres, again, congratulations on the commission. Thank you for today. Thank you all for coming. Meeting adjourned.